I had this really long, flowery, fantastic introduction for Don Nielsen, but if there's anybody in this club that doesn't need an introduction, it's Don. I'm just always amazed when we have one of our own members get up and how after the meeting everybody's going, wow, I had no idea he was such a good speaker. You know, a prophet really is without honor in his own land. Please welcome Don Nielsen. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today and uh, a pleasure to uh, have all of you stick around and listen to my thoughts on education. Before I begin though, Bill, I want to just say how great a job you are doing as president of this club. It's just it's fabulous. And uh, I, <laughs> the other suggestion I could make to you is to get a bigger podium because it's hard to put your computer and your notes on, on this thing. So. We, we, we are, or we're doing a lot of innovating around here, but I think that's one we could do. Uh, okay, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but we'll try. Um, let me say before I begin my remarks that I have to share with you a confession. And the confession is that I find as I grow older that I become crotchier, crotchier <laughs> that I become less patient, that I become less uh, tolerant. Uh, I start thinking about things that are impossible to others but are possible to me. And, and I have this sense of urgency. And I don't know whether it's a sign of old age, whether it is the early onset of dementia, or whether it might be just a little bit of wisdom creeping into this old head. Now, I'm going to let you decide what's going on with me. But today, I want to be bold. I want to share with you five ideas that I think, if Im implemented, will dramatically improve the public education system of this country. With the exception of one of the ideas, which I wrote about in an editorial last week, none of these ideas are being talked about in the halls of government or in business or civic associations, which again causes me to wonder, am I out on a limb or are people just not getting it? Um, for the past 14 years, I have been a student of public education. The first two years I spent traveling the United States, talking to educational leaders and visiting schools. Another eight years was spent on the Seattle School Board. And since then, I have been a student of state and federal education policies. So I think I have a little bit of background in the subject. I have done this because I believe that our public schools are the single most important institution in our society. And that, <laughs> it, it is also based on the fact that in order to live in a civilized society, we must have ed educated citizens. And not only do we need educated citizens to have a civilized society, we need educated citizens to have an educated electorate to preserve our democracy. In my mind, both are in risk today. So failing to educate our children puts our very way of life in jeopardy. Is this thing working yet? Can, can I, I, I can't get it to go. There we go. Okay. Does it work? Can you take the, it is working. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I also believe, and this sounds funny, I also believe that our education system, as we now know it, is not broken. A lot of people say it's broken. It's not broken. It is operating exactly as it was designed to operate. <laughs> it was designed for a different era and for a different need. It was designed when this nation needed about 25% of, of its young people to, to be well-educated enough to go to post-secondary education. About half of our children needed to be educated well enough to be good workers in factories and on the farm. And the balance could fend for themselves. It was okay. That was built into the system. That level of performance has been in place and successfully been achieved for 100 years. However, as you well know, our world has changed and our school systems have not. 
One guy once told, said to me, if Rip Van Winkle went to sleep in the year 1900 and woke up in the year 2000, the only thing that he would resemble or that would be familiar to him would be the scooter. <laughs> what was good enough in the first half of the last century is simply not good enough now. Our present system is obsolete, and it has become increasingly obsolete as the decades have, trans have gone by. Today, in my mind, we have a crisis in education, and unless we fix it, we will create an enormous underclass of citizens who will prevent our country from competing in the world economy, and perhaps more importantly, put our very way of life at risk. Now, that's the issue. Now, let me first describe the extent of the problem, and then I'll share with you some of my proposed solutions. Most economists and business leaders believe that today's jobs, and more importantly, tomorrow's jobs, are going to require a minimum of two years of post-secondary education. A minimum of post-secondary education. In other words, if a young person wants to earn a living wage or salary in this country, they will have to attend a community college for at least two years or a four-year college. That's going to be a requirement. Well, given that rea reality, let's see how we're doing in preparing our children. If we have 100 children who enter high school, now, and now bear in mind, we lose some kids before high school. I don't know how many, and the statistics don't give us that number. But we lose some, 3 to 5 percent perhaps. But let's assume we don't lose any. So we have 100 children who enter high school, okay? Of those 100, 71 will graduate. That's an average for the nation. Okay? Of those 71, 42 will enter a four-year college or a uh, two-year uh, community college. Okay? Still with me? Of those 42, 20 will graduate. And they will graduate within three years in a two-year program or within six years in a four-year program. In other words, 80% of the children in our nation, when they reach adulthood, will be ill-equipped for the workplace that they will enter. 80%. Today, there are 50 million children in the public schools of America. If we do not change that statistic, 40 million children that are now in school today will be ill-prepared to participate in this society. Not only is that a problem for those children, but think about the impact on our very way of life. As jobs go begging for skilled workers, business, universities, uh, even our own government finds, uh, finds it impossible to find qualified employees for the tasks that need to be done. If we don't change this situation, we will rapidly become a second-rate power with millions, millions living in poverty. We will also see an increase in crime, because those who have nothing will try to take it from those who do. It's just the way it goes. It's not a pretty picture, but it will definitely occur if we don't change our schools and how they operate. So, what should we do about it? Well, I have five suggestions, and I should tell you, I'm writing a book on how to change the American public school system, so I have a lot more ideas than five. <laughs> but I'm going to give you five today. About half of the children who now attend our schools, and that's 25 million people, 25 million students attend urban systems. In most cities, the graduation rate is lower than the 71% I just mentioned. If you are an African American, your graduation rate probability is 50%, one out of two. If you are Hispanic, it's about 43%. New York City, which is making great strides over the last several years, still has a graduation rate under 50%. Moreover, even if you graduate, you may or may not be educated. You've all heard stories about people who can't read their diploma. It's still going on. It happens. It's a reality. So it doesn't mean you're prepared for work or post-secondary education. 
Obviously, this situation is not solely the responsibility of our schools, but I have to tell you that I think the solution has to be the responsibility of our schools. Our schools, particularly our urban schools, must start performing much better than they are today. To have that happen will require years of sustained effort to develop educational environments that meet the needs of today's students. This cannot be done in one or two years. It requires superb leadership, a detailed plan of action, and time enough to implement the plan. None of that is now occurring in the urban systems of this country. Urban school boards are the governance entity for huge organizations. Here in Seattle, which is a relatively small urban system with only 46,000 students, we still have a budget of $500 million a year and 8,000 employees. This is not a walk in the park. Most urban systems are multi-billion dollar enterprises. School boards, particularly in cities, tend to change every two years, causing a change in policy and direction. Often it results in a change of superintendent, which further exacerbates an already difficult situation. The average tender, tenure of an urban superintendent is 2.3 years. In Washington, D.C., they've had seven superintendents in the last 15 years. Here in Seattle, we've had three. Moreover, the type of people who choose to run for office in our cities has declined, in my mind, particularly for school board. More often than not, the people who run for school board are unqualified for the position. Now, we periodically get somebody good, and we have somebody good today on our school board, Michael DeBell. He's sitting right over here. And, Michael, thank you for serving. <laughs> Qualified people seldom run for office in urban systems. It's just the way it is. And one of the reasons for that is, number one, uh, it's, it's very unattractive activity to do. Secondly, in school boards, there's little or no status to the position. And board members are regularly assailed by irate citizens who have special issues or actions or agendas that they want to go their way, and they make no bones about telling you about it. The result is that school board races now attract candidates who are, in my mind, either social activists or union sympathizers. This combination of people creates a volatile mixture of special interests. As is the case with our current school board, the five other members that Michael has to put up with each day, <laughs> this combination of people seldom can, uh, can agree on a common vision or agenda. In fact, often they don't even like each other. The situation we now have in Seattle is not unique to Seattle. It is the norm in urban systems in America. It is unlikely we can, anytime soon, improve the attractiveness of running for public office. Even if we could, it would take time, and our children can't wait. They need leaders now, and they need leaders who put children first. They need an alignment of an educational and academic program that will get them the education they both need and deserve. That cannot happen with our current system of school governance. Today, there is not a single urban system in America, not a single urban system in America, that has put together a sustained program sustained program of improvement in their schools. Not one. Now, not one with an elected school board. There are a couple, Chicago and to an extent Boston, uh, are doing some great things with long-term committed citizens. To me, going to an appointed school board is the first step in correcting the problems of governance in urban America. Okay, idea number two. And they get more bold as we go along. <laughs> I think we ought to modify certification laws. Certified is no guarantee of qualified. Until it is, why bother? Today in our state, 50% of our math teachers have neither a minor or a major in math. 40% of our science teachers have neither a minor or a major in science. However, all are certified. It is, a, is it any wonder that our children don't do well in math and science? To become interested in any subject, 
you need a passionate teacher who really understands the subject and is able to deliver it with enthusiasm and, and connect you to your interests and your, and your own abilities. Teachers without subject matter competency simply cannot do that. Our present certification laws focus on teacher training, not subject matter competency. We train our education students to teach content as opposed to teaching content proficient people to be teachers. We address it backwards. Certification laws also keep competent people out of the profession by requiring everyone to go back to college for at least a year, if not longer, to become certified to do something they already know how to do. For example, Gerard Schwartz, conductor of the Seattle Symphony, could not teach music in the Seattle Public Schools. <laughs> Bill Gates could not teach technology. Bonnie Dunbar, former astronaut, current president of the Museum of Flight, could not teach science. You see my point. Just out of curiosity, how many people in this room had at one time or another have thought about becoming a teacher but decided not to do so because of the need to go back for a year of education? How many? Okay, well, good. Hopefully we can help you do that. <laughs> Certification laws also give a monopoly to education schools for the supply of the human capital that's allowed to enter our schools. Though there are some, edu some excellent education schools and we have three right here in Seattle, the UW, SU, and SPU, all three have outstanding education schools. But the vast majority are mediocre. There are 1,200 education schools in this country, an average of 24 per state. In the state of Washington, we have 22. The state of Virginia has 50. In a report by Arthur Levine, former president of Columbia University, he calls for remaking teacher education. His study describes most education schools as, as, quote, programs that teach outdated curricula and have failed to keep pace with demographics, technology, the global competition, and pressures to raise student achievement. He goes on to state, universities have exacerbated the situation by continuing to treat teacher preparation programs as cash cows, leading them to set low admission and graduation standards for their students. Now, in spite of this situation, our schools have some wonderfully gifted teachers, but not nearly enough. And most of those who are successful teachers will tell you that their education preparation was inadequate for the job they now face. This is particularly true for teachers who teach in our cities and who teach children whose native language is not English. A lot, of, a lot of our people believe that the answer to education is smaller class sizes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you show me a small class with a lousy teacher and I'll show you a small lousy class. <laughs> I believe certification laws should be modified. And I think they should be modified so that certification is something you earn in the classroom after a proven ability to have children learn under your care. And you should not gain certification until at least three years of teaching. And if you do not get certified within five years of teaching, you should be invited to do something else as a profession. Okay? So change certification laws. Third idea. Change the way we train and se or select and train our leaders. Today, if you wanted to become a principal, you would first have to have been a teacher for three years. You would then need to apply to an education school where you would spend a year in principal training. Now, that sounds very reasonable, but that's only part of the story. Let me give you an example. I could be the world's worst teacher. I mean, I could be grossly incompetent, and I could unilaterally decide to become a principal. And I do. And to apply to an education school, because we have so many of them, to apply is to get in. To get in is to graduate. <laughs> to graduate is to get hired. And in three years, I have tenure. And the school district and the students are stuck with me for the next 20 to 30 years. It happens all the time in our public education system. You know, public education is the only system in our society that I know of where promotion is done by self-selection. 
We get leadership by accident, not by design, in our public schools. Again, I'm not saying we don't have outstanding principles. We most certainly do. We have lots of them. But we don't have as many as we need. And again, most of them will tell you that their principal training program did not adequately prepare them for the job they now hold. One of the best principal training programs in the country, in fact, is right here in Seattle at the University of Washington. It's called the Danforth Program. But it only takes 32 candidates a year. There are over 2,500 schools in the state of Washington. There's almost 100,000 schools in the United States. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, the same thing is true for superintendents. Only a few states, of which Washington is one, do not require a superintendent to be certified. That was what allowed us to hire John Stanford. The opening that allowed the, the, the mass, vast majority of states, and I think like 45 out of 50, require superintendents to be certified. So, once again, to get certified, you have to go back to an education school. And more often than not, it's a PhD program. And more often than not, you will come out with a PhD in curriculum. Well, today, I would defy anybody in this room to find a superintendent training program that prepares adequately superintendents for urban systems. They simply do not exist. If I were to create a program, it would include professors from the education school, the business school, the public policy school, the architecture school, the computer science school, and the medical school. Urban superintendents need to know how to run big organizations, how to create an effective education program, how to deal with unions and negotiate union contracts, how to manage major capital projects, how to infuse technology into their management systems and their education programs, how to deal with political leaders, how to develop and raise money for bonds and levies. And they need to know how children develop, and they need to have an appreciation for adolescent medicine. There is no superintendent program in the country that deals with any of, or virtually any of these issues. None. You know, I find it very interesting. In this country, we have four major universities, fully funded by the federal government, set up for the sole purpose of training leaders for our military. There's not a single institution not federally funded, not state funded, not locally funded, set up to train leaders for our schools. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe this nation is far more vulnerable from within than from without. It's time we got serious about training leaders. <laughs> Creating competent, gifted leaders for our schools and our districts would be the single most important move we could make to enhance the education of our children. A great school can only occur with an outstanding principal. One begets the other, and you will never find one without the other. And the same is true of districts. Idea number four. Extend the school day and the school year. Yeah. America has the shorter, shortest academic year in the developed world. Here's some samples of the rest of the world. Now, I wouldn't suggest for a minute that we try to adopt the Japanese school system, but you need to understand that a Japanese child, at, upon graduation, has attended school for four academic years longer than an American child at the same age. It's not hard to understand why American students don't fare well in international examinations. Moreover, in most of these countries, teachers are subject matter competent and are better able to instill their students in their students a love of a subject. Teaching is a high-status profession in virtually all other countries, and only the most competent of citizens are allowed into the profession. Because teachers in these countries work a longer year and a longer day, they are also far better compensated. If America were, go were to go to a seven-hour day, a 205-day year, Think about that. Seven hours a day, I'm adding one hour per day, and I'm adding 25 days to the school year. If we just did that, we would increase the academic time of our students by one-third. Over the course of four years, that's four academic years of education more at age 18. I have no doubt that our children would learn more and be better equipped for post-secondary school if we simply changed the school calendar they would be far better equipped also to compete in this new world economy. Idea number five may be the boldest idea. 
I think we ought to eliminate grades. I think we ought to eliminate grades, yearly grades, and I think we ought to eliminate grades A, B, and C. Today, if you are eight years of age, you are in the third grade. It doesn't matter whether you're reading at a kindergarten level or a sixth grade level. Because you're eight, you're in the third grade. You will also stay in that grade for the entire year, regardless of how well or poorly you perform. Moreover, every third, every third grade class will have a wide variety of learning levels, but an identical level of age. Thus, a teacher has to teach to the middle or to the bottom. Doesn't matter what he or she does, a group of students are deprived. The result is that some children's learning suffers and teacher frustration increases. By going to achievement levels, each class would be made up of students who are at the same level of achievement. Now don't confuse this with ability groupings. I don't agree with ability groupings. But achievement levels simply recognizes where the child is when they enter, enter the school or enter the grade. The lower the level, the smaller the class size, the more individualized attention they will need. As a child masters one level, he or she moves to the next level, regardless of whether the month of June has arrived. Today our schools are organized by age and they need to be organized by learning levels of readiness. One would never think of putting beginning swimmers and advanced swimmers in the same class. We do it every day in our schools. We should also eliminate grades A, B, and C. These grades tell us nothing about learning. They tell us a lot about who's the smartest, uh, but they don't necessarily tell us who's learning. Even, even that isn't accurate, as you all know, grade inflation's run amok in this country. Uh, the universities will tell you that a straight-A student from one high school bears no resemblance to a straight-A student from another high school. Uh, uh, the grading this way causes us to treat school much like a swimming meet, using the same metaphor, as opposed to a swimming lesson. We really don't expect everyone to learn to swim, but we are certainly interested in who's the bestest. Students should be graded either below standard, at standard, or above standard. Those below will need more time and attention. There go the longer day and longer year. Those above standard need more options to continue their learning. Though we need students who excel, we absolutely have to ensure that every child learns. By extending the day and year, we can mitigate the age differences in these various classes. So, those are the five changes I would make if I can remake our school system. You will note that I have not talked about money. I don't believe putting more money into a failed system makes the system any better. Our nation now spends $450 billion on public education. That's a 100% increase in real dollars spent in the last 30 years. With a doubling of our costs, our children's learning has not materially improved, and it won't unless we change the system. Today, 85% of the money that we put into our districts goes for payroll and payroll-related costs. As a consequence, when we give more money to our schools, all that happens is the adults on the payroll make more money. We now require our schools to provide social services, transportation services, food services, etc., and that was not the case 30 years ago. Interestingly enough, today, the United States is the only nation in the developed world where the number of people on the payroll who teach is less than half of the total payroll. With a changed system, we will definitely need more, need more money to finance the longer day and the longer year. But I would argue that we could get rid of a lot of the other services that we are now requiring schools to do. Having said that, we need to remember that this is an airplane that needs to be fixed while it's flying. We cannot afford to stop and start again while our children suffer. So the forthcoming levies that are coming up in February need to be passed. But we also need to change the system. So let me summarize. I'm coming in for a landing, Bill. <laughs> let me summarize. Today we have a public education system that is input focused and we need a system that is output focused. We have a system that is adult focused and we need a system that is student focused. We have a system that is teaching focused and we need a system that's learning focused. We have a system that is time focused and we need a system that is achievement focused. And we have a system that is group focused and we need one that's individually focused. Other than that, it's great. <laughs> Let me leave you with this final comment. I want to refer you back to 1983 and the famous report, Nation at Risk. In the preamble of that report was the following comment. If an unfriendly foreign power had imposed our schools upon us, we would have considered it an act of war. 
That's taken from the preamble of the nation at risk. Ladies and gentlemen, that was 23 years ago. Nothing materially has changed in public education in the intervening 23 years. Ladies and gentlemen, if we as a society believe we need to educate all of our children, then my friends, it's time to declare war. Thank you very much. See, I told you it was going to be a great program. Before we go, once again, I urge you to take time this week to call or visit an old friend. It will do you both a world of good. Which brings us to this week's pretty good rule. Fortune favors the well-prepared. The harder you work, the luckier you get. See you next week. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from Enterprise Seattle. For over 35 years, Enterprise Seattle has provided client-based economic development services to businesses throughout King County and its 39 cities. More information on Enterprise Seattle and how they help businesses grow and prosper can be found at www.enterpriseseattle.org. And by First Choice Health working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.